Uh, sorry for the false start. So now it is time for me to start. Uh, hello again. Um, I'm Kerry, Kerry Jones. Um, I am a teacher, trainer, materials writer, lots of different hats, which I'm sure you all wear as well. So I'd, just to know um, what context you're working in, hands up if you're at teaching, have a class at the moment, even if it's only one. Like me, I only have one class at the moment. Okay, lots of teachers. Uh, teacher trainers? Sometimes, yeah. in some ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, materials writers? Yeah, sometimes, in some ways, okay, great. Um, and lots of other things as well, I'm sure. Managers, consultants, publishers, editors. You know, you don't have to put your hands up, but <laughs> okay. So. Um, what we're going to be concentrating today actually is one thing that we haven't shouted out for. So maybe you're also one of these, a student? Yeah, yeah, student of something. Yeah, okay. So, um, and we're going to be looking at this idea of peer power, of how students learn with and from each other mainly. Okay, but first, let's just look at the first bit, peer power the importance of peers. And we're going to think, first of all, outside the language classroom, outside the staff room, just out there in the big wide world. And I'd like to share an anecdote with you. Do you know what these are? Sails. What kind of sails? Windsurfing sails. Yeah, OK. So. Um, Recently, over the last five or six years, I think maybe it's some kind of a late midlife crisis, I've decided that I have to learn something new every year. And my project last year, my new thing to learn was windsurfing. And actually, it had been on my list, my wish list for a long time, because I live in the south of Spain, on the coast, and one thing we have in plentiful quantities is wind. Um, in fact, so much wind, it's quite difficult to learn to windsurf because there's too much of the stuff. Um, um, but it's taken me ages to get, to get round to it because, A, my kids were too little, so I had to wait until they were old enough to do the windsurfing course with me because it's that kind of mother thing, you know, keep the family together, learn to, the family that learns together, etc. Uh, but also, um, a very good friend of mine, moved back to Spain from Edinburgh and her children more or less the same age as my children and she also although she'd been born in the town where we live had never learned to windsurf so suddenly I was galvanized into action by having a mate who also wanted to do the same thing and a mother with children and we did it oh my god the first course was hell has anyone here learned to windsurf Tried once, yeah, okay. We did an eight hour course over four um, Saturdays. And, um, and we got there in the end, I did learn. I can turn, I can come back again, I can stay on. I mean, like, you know, I was really, really pleased with my, pro with my progress over the eight hours. Um, the kids learned a hell of a lot more, but it was Hema, my friend, who was my anchor through the whole course. Now the instructor, because this is Spain and um, we knowledge is valued massively, would start the lesson off with theory. <laughs> On the board, all kinds of weird lines where the wind's coming from, angles, maths, I couldn't get it. Um, what helped me there was the boys, because they were quite used to this constantly listening to someone telling them stuff at school and they were picking up very quickly. So I could kind of, when they repeated it, I got it. But once they got on the boards, they're young, they're strong, they, they're, they're thrill seekers, they were just off. Hema was the person who was closest to me in struggling getting the sail off, in not quite understanding where's the wind coming from and what does that mean and what do I have to do with my sail and all the rest of it. So together, we learned. And we were so, so proud of ourselves. So Hema was my peer who took me through that windsurfing course 
not the instructor who really I learned very little from. The boys, hmm, they helped. They were very um, patronizing to their mums, but really it was Hema who was my, my rock through that course. So um, just very quickly and silently, and can you think of someone in your life who has been the person who supported you in some kind of learning experience? I'm just gonna ask you to leaf through that album of memories and see if you can just think of someone. I'm not going to ask you to share. Okay, so I'm going to take the anecdote for us to explore this concept of near peer role models. And um, you might say, well, why was Hema a near peer? She's 10 years younger than me. She's fitter than me. And I think um, that made her a near peer rather than an exact peer. And she did learn to windsurf better than me. But this was the situation, this near peer role model. So there's me um, trying to learn from the instructor, but the instructor was way too far away. That he wasn't a model for my performance in any way at all. And then there were the Sams. Both of our sons are called Sam. Right? Uh, it gets confusing. And, and there was Hema, my, my rock my role model. And so I learned to windsurf thanks to her example, her persistence. Together, we were learning with and from each other. Okay, so let's take it a little bit closer to um, teaching. First of all, just think a moment about the near peer. So a near peer is comparable to us in some way, okay? So Hema, a mother, her, she has a son who's the same age as my son, who's got the same name as my son. Maybe we're a little bit too comparable, but we can relate to each other. I could not relate to the instructor who was very offhand and, you know, you beginners. Oh. So what about this picture? This is um, three teachers who I work with in Cadiz in the south of Spain. And um, they are working together on a very concrete, practical teaching problem. And uh, the three of them are in positions of coordination. And um, they all support and train teachers. But at this particular moment, it was during a mini conference um, that we hold uh, there's a, uh, we have a teacher's association called Tefel del Sur of the South. And we have these moments when uh, we get together with very hands-on sessions. And they were trying to work out the best way to give the instructions for this game. That's what it was. It was something very simple. But we had these three teachers, between them 30 years of experience, helping each other to find the best way to do something. And so... I think we all recognize that within our contexts of having peers who teach with us, who write with us, who train with us, who are the people who are closest to us and help us best to do things better. No? I'm sure you can imagine you, it's even easier to find an example of that in your life. And so there's this idea of working within a community of practice. Um, this has come up in quite a few talks. I've noticed a lot of people talking about communities of practice. So uh, are you familiar with the term? Are you familiar with the idea? Yeah? So if you look at the definition, that's us, no? I mean, even here at the conference, a community of practice, or here in this room, uh, or in your staff room, it's this idea of sharing a concern or even a passion. And this idea of wanting to do it better by doing it together. Okay, so let's get even closer to the people that we're interested in. I think that this can apply to our classes. This is what our classes are. Even if they haven't chosen the people that they're in the community with, the class can become a community of practice. 
because all of those students are there together sharing the concern of learning the language and learning to do it better together. And yes, we're there to manage, to facilitate, to support, but they're actually doing the learning together. So just this idea of our learners in the classroom as a community of practice. Okay, so we're shifting into language learning now and getting closer to what we really want to focus on. And I have another anecdote to share with you. So this is um, an experiment um, that I um, carried out with a, a, a teacher, a colleague, um, quite a few years ago now. The two of us, uh, were part of the teacher development coordination within the school where we were working. And one of the things we were trying to do was encourage teachers to team teach. It was one of the things that we wanted them to do as part of their development program. Um, uh, but it wasn't really going very well. So it was optional, it was you decide who you want to teach with, what you want to do. So we decided that we'd try it ourselves. Uh, now you're thinking, oh, this isn't learners, this is teachers and trainers, but bear with me. So um, the only time when the two of us had classes at the same time, the classes were at very different levels. I had a class of A2 students, elementary students, and the other teacher had a class of B2 students who were preparing for their Cambridge First Certificate exam. Um, but we thought, hey, fine, we'll bring them together. And it was a lull in the year, it was after the mid-year um, exams, the first certificate group had done their mock exams. It was a, you know the mock, do you do mock exams in your context? There are so many exams for them to have to practice and it takes time and they don't, they feel they've lost the rhythm and the flow of the usual stimulation of their English lesson. So we wanted to boost that energy again. So what we did was my class, the A2 class, um, wrote questions so they would interview the B2 students about um, language learning, about the first certificate exam, because at A2 their goal was to get the B2 exam. But they were a long way off. And I don't know about in your context, but this is something that's very common within a Spanish context. That they're, sorry, adult learners. They come in, they want to get their B2 certificate or their B1 certificate, but it's at least a year, a year and a half, two years away, and it can be demotivating. So basically, these students were preparing to interview the other class. The other class didn't have to do anything. No preparation at all. And then we brought the two classes together. And um, my students, I had a larger class, worked in pairs to interview one student from the other class. And using their questions as a basis, they interviewed the other student. The interviews lasted 45 minutes, which was much longer than we'd thought, than we'd, well, we'd not that we'd catered for, we didn't mind because it was fantastic. And they just kept on going and going. And it was in English the whole time. They'd really kind of got this idea of having someone that they could question and, and get as much English in out of them as possible. And um, it was great. It was a great success. And looking at it afterwards, we were thinking, wow, OK, look what happened here between these two groups of students. The A2 students were in control of the communication, although their side of the communication was quite controlled because they'd prepared for it. The B2 students were responding to questions that they more or less knew they were going to be interviewed about the exam and about learning English, but still they were working with spontaneous language. But more interestingly, the A2 students were pushing themselves to understand the B2 students and were able to because they had a lot in common. They were all Spanish speaking students. The B2 students were having to grade their language. 
paraphrase, um, make themselves more comprehensible, more understandable to the students who were interviewing them. And it was like, from a, from a linguistic point of view, it was fascinating. Um, so we asked the students to fill in questionnaires about the whole experience to see what they got out of it. And here are some of the responses from both groups. Take a, take a minute or so maybe to read through. Okay, so in bold, I've kind of picked out the cognitive side of the experience for both groups of students. And highlighted the emotional side of it. So we have this idea of, um, look, they're happy, interesting, nice and good, okay, maybe not the most sophisticated of language, but basically it was a very positive language using moment for them that really boosted everybody's energy levels, boosted everybody's motivation. And it was generally something that the students reflected on their use of the language. And then we had this thing of the A2 students being in awe of the B2 students. <gasps> Look what they did in two years. But also that, hey, if they did it, I can do it. I, I can be that good. And the B2 students, like, you know, puffed out and proud as peacocks, is like, ha, my English, so much better. <laughs> and so, so it, being on both sides of the near peer model was positive for everyone. So here we go, the same model, just a different context. Okay. And so looking at it from a point of view of how is this helping these students with their motivation? So we can look at the near peers Okay, the B2 students are definitely far more relatable than me. But also there's this idea of they were a model. And a model that wasn't the standard teacher, course book, proficient speaker model. So that it's possible to be competent, to be successful as a user and not be one of those standard models. Effective L2 communication was actually being modeled on both sides. And in a way, yeah, the real English speaking world, I'm not so sure for our experiment that that was true because this was actually a very artificial situation for those students because they're all Spanish speakers. And I'm sure that once they stepped out the door, they were not speaking to each other in English anymore. But in that moment, in that capsule, the thing that had been important was speaking in English. So we have the, if you can do it, I can do it, this boost in self-belief, but also a kind of a creating an L2 self-image, a future self, which is within reach. Not something which is, which is kind of like a dream. No, this is very real. It's okay not to be perfect. A lot of Spanish students are massively hung up on mistakes and not making them. Um, especially adult students, especially older adult students. The A2 thing of, I can understand them. This was like 40 minutes of interaction in English, which was something that they could understand. And I'm not so sure that number four was a point that was covered in my experiment, but certainly could be in other contexts. So we can see how near peers working together can enhance learning. They have a positive self-belief. It was a positive experience for all. A little less worried about using English. They think they can do something and we know that the 
Experiencing success is one of the greatest motivators. You experience success, you can build on success. Okay, so that's just from the research, the background research. But there's something else that I think that we know, we know it so well, we forget about it completely, that students talking to each other is really, really important. And not only because of the dynamic of how much time. So we're used to the argument of why should we use pair work or group work in the classroom? Well, because you have 18 students, if they only speak to you for 18 minutes, they get a minute each. Put them in groups, automatically it's more. But it's not just more time. Something is different about the way students speak to each other than how they speak to a supposed expert, the teacher, the authority figure. So look, students speak more, okay, fine. But they use a greater variety of structures. There are more questions asked than when they're talking to the teacher. There's more repair, there's more negotiation of meaning. They use more varied language. And they produce longer terms. Now, this has been measured, it's been studied. It's something that we intuitively know, don't we? Have you ever told your students this? I didn't until I actually saw it written in black and white and thought, oh, yeah, okay, uh, duh, obvious. But um, it helps. You know, we all have the students who'd rather talk to the teacher. They don't make eye contact with their peer. They're looking to you all the time. So maybe if we share this little secret with them, it means that they'll value the peer interaction more. So, the experiment that I told you about, obviously, was a one-off. We didn't do that every week, you know, totally um, unrealistic. And in fact, uh, bringing classes of two different levels together is not something that we're going to be able to do all the time either. So um, there have to be other ways as well that we can exploit this idea of peers or near peers coming into the classroom. So here are, well, first of all, actually, quickly turn to someone sitting next to you. How else could you bring near peers into the classroom? Very quickly. Okay, sorry, I'm going to stop you already. So, my, my anecdote was about different levels working together, yeah? They don't have to be in the same classroom together. You could have one class creating videos or audios to share with another class, for example. So that way you can bring in students of the same level or of different levels. Maybe you can choose videos of people that your students can relate to. I mean, um, I have Ben sitting here at the front, and I know this is one of his favorites, is the football hero, whose English is second language English. But that is an idol, you know? Wow, what a role model. So you can bring in people from the students' um, life experience, they're, who they're interested in as possible peer role models. Any class, there's no such thing as a homogenous class, is there? Where every single student is an exact horizontal peer. They have different strengths and weaknesses. And so, in fact, every, every student in the class is in some way a near peer for another student in the class. So by exploring 
and underlining and emphasizing and bringing out the different strengths, then we can use any class as peer role models for each other. And not only language. We know this, don't we, about the topics that some students are such massive experts in and they love to share with everyone else. And this again, this is someone who is enthusiastically talking about one of their interests in English is creating the same kind of near peer model. And student generated content. It's the same thing. They're talking about the topics that they're interested in. They're in control of the topics that we're discussing in class. And all of this builds towards putting the attention on the students as a community of practice working together, working hard together to do something better. But a lot of these things take time, right? And we're busy. And how much time do we have to structure all of these things? Oh, sorry. So let's have a look at some ready-made peer power. And um, this is where I'm coming to the course that uh, Ben, myself, and others have been involved in recently with Cambridge University Press um, called Evolve. And at the lower levels, we have these peers who come into the class during the lesson, virtually, um, to talk to the students. So we have our contributors, our student contributors, who would contribute topics as well. So the, the discussion topics in the course have been built on um, this idea of the students contributing their ideas of what they want to talk about. And we have clips of these student contributors. I'd like you to introduce you to one. Here's my family tree. So here are my sisters, Camila and Jessica. She's 23 and she's 21. Here are my mom and my dad. She's Jamile and he is Luis. And here are my grandparents. So she is Berta, here is Jose Antonio, and here is Lucila, and here is also Liz. And that's my, my basic family tree. Okay, so you can see here um, a student who is doing a task that this is, an, this is for A1, that the students themselves are going to perform in class. And we know when we're giving the instructions for a task, we give a model. But us giving the model, ah, it's OK. Listening to another student successfully perform the task and give a model, so much better. So that's one simple way that we bring peer models into the classroom. At higher levels, we don't have student contributors. We have expert speakers. What does this mean? Well, basically, they are people who are living and working through the medium of English. They have come from another language background. So they're using English as an L2. And they, for a B2, C1 student, this is their future self. Let's listen to one. Recently, I watched a documentary about minimalism, which is a theory that says you should have only what you really need in life. Uh, we live in a society that encourages you to buy, buy, buy and consume all the time. So for me, watching that at this moment was very important to really evaluate what I need and to value more who we are and not what we have. Okay, so a lovely message there, don't you think? But also, this isn't a perfect speaker. There are little hesitations, but she repairs, she gets it right, she's expressing herself beautifully. So this is a role model that the students, they do look up to, but she's real 
to them. Okay, do I have time for one very short last message? Okay, so here's Enrique. Listen to his very short message. <laughs> um, what I've learned that helps me is just do like quicker tasks, like doing, like completing point A and point B to get to point C. So it's like little tiny milestones to accomplish something. So there's not as like, you don't see the finish line. You don't focus on the finish line. You just focus on like the one step at a time situation. Okay, so um, Enrique isn't talking about peer power or learning English. He's talking about doing his tasks at work. But I think it's a lovely way to round off that what Enrique is saying is rather than look at how far away your end goal is, take it step by step. And so a near peer model is a step. And so you've got there, oh look, there's another one. And it just pushes you a step further. And so this idea of directional motivation, have you come across this idea that Donier has been exploring recently with Muir about the idea that each, each successful task within the classroom is a step in the right direction and it keeps the motivation rolling. So we think that this idea of bringing peers into the classroom can help with this step-by-step -step directional motivation. Okay, I think I may well have run out of question time, but feel free to come and ask me any questions. Um, here are the references if anybody wants to take a quick photo. I'm gonna do what Tyson did in his talk, which was five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Photos taken, okay. <laughs> Um, this is a collection of Cambridge white papers on the subject of peer interaction <clears throat> and speaking. And if you have any questions that you'd like to send me by email, here's my email address. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>